Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. And um, thank you very much, Peter, for setting the stage and doing such a, uh, a good job in teasing out the big issues. I think on the compact, um, it's always a, a pleasure and an honour to speak after you. And um, I, I feel unduly privileged to speak before my two colleagues from the institutions um, who have very important things to say on this subject. Looking around the room to have such a distinguished audience is also a great pleasure. I, um, my subject matter is quite a specific one. It's human rights, sustainable development and implementation. What do we do with this thing? So, I have done quite a lot of work since 2016 on embedding the compact, particularly the migration compact, in a discourse about what are we trying to do. Uh, and I started off looking at this, asking the question, what is unsafe, disorderly, and irregular migration? Because to understand what we're trying to, to end with safe, orderly, and regular needs to be unpacked in the first place. And then I went on to see how the compact was embedded in human rights. And another colleague of mine, who was at that time working for the Icelandic government, had been to a conference of foreign ministries from the Nordic states, and was astonished when she presented to them the principle which we jurists consider to be completely normal, that human rights apply to everyone, including migrants. And the jurists from the foreign ministries of the Nordic states, remember this is the Nordic states, our great human rights friendly Nordic states, were horrified at the idea that migrants should be able to access human rights. So we realized that into this compact we were going to need to look at that particular framework. We, of course, are here in a member in a state, a member state, which is extremely <coughs> vocal in placing the compact only in the context of SDGs. Sustainable De Development Goals and DFID has been running the shop on this with the Foreign Office and the Home Office has been marginalised. Great supporters of, um, of the compact part of, of course, the UK government's post-Brexit reappearance on the international scene in a highly contested field like migration when we're losing free movement of persons in the EU. So all kinds of political reasons why the UK was there. But the framing of, around SDGs is a, a non-legal framing. If there's one thing that sustainable development goals are not, is legal as such. And you may follow the judgments of the Court of Justice of the European Union, you will have noticed uh, another challenge has been kicked out by the court from a reference from Spain on the um, legality of austerity measures taken in Spain after the uh, 2008 crisis. And the court has once again said, sorry, economic stuff, not our, not our, not our issue. Uh, we have the adoption of the, uh, of, the, of the compact on migration. And this was the Marrakesh, New York um, General Assembly um, trial around December 2018, highly politicized. 152 states voted in favor. Dissenting in the EU, we have the Czech Republic and Poland actually voting against. And of course, with the US um, uh, and Israel, and we had the abstentions, Australia, Bulgaria, Italy, Latvia, and Romania. And you said, what do these countries have in common? Uh, and one might say, well, not an awful lot. Uh, Italy is a founder of the European Union, Austria is a latecomer, uh, Bulgaria, Romania, you know, one of the latest to join. What have they got in common? There's a very interesting article that was published in the political journal Politico in uh, January 2019, tracking the alt-right campaign in Europe against the global compact. And I ran into this recently where I was somewhere where I, um, an MEP got up and started railing at me about how the global compact creates a right to migrate. 
very glad you were elected. I think we should have to say no more. Um, but what is particularly important to remember about this when you look at the countries is that old right campaign had no difficulty hopping across language barriers, hopping across different states with different political frameworks. Uh, the, you could say that Austria and Italy may have similar uh, right wing coalitions, but that's certainly not the case in respect of Latvia or Romania. They have quite different constellations, let alone the uh, Czech Republic and, um, uh, and Poland. I would also say about Poland, it's astonishing that they voted against the Global Compact on Migration, as they're responsible for about one million, then singly, one country alone, of the three million first residence permits issued to foreigners in the EU. And they all go to Ukrainians. So you have uh, about half a million Ukrainians have been pouring into Poland every year since Mr. Putin decided to annex Crimea and create instability in Eastern Ukraine. Uh, and when they arrive in Poland, uh, they're given immediately working residence permits. And basically, they, they're posted workers all across Central and Eastern Europe, and unemployment is very, very low. And what was the response of the EU to this? massive influx of migrants, far outweighing the Syrians in 2015-2016. Well, you may have noticed last year the European Parliament and the institutions voted to lift the mandatory visa requirement on Ukraine. But, going on to the question of human rights and, um, uh, uh, and development. So first of all, towards the Global Compact on Migration, we see a, an inflation of references to human rights from the New York Declaration of 2016 to uh, the uh, final version in 2018. And we have the statement that the Global Compact on Migration is based on international human rights law and upholds the principles of non regression and non discrimination. Okay, so non regression is there to say. States are not permitted to use the compact and its implementation to undermine existing human rights guarantees which apply also to migrants. Okay, so this is what non-regression is. We can only move to greater human rights protection. We cannot use this new agreement in 2018 to undermine what already existed. Non-discrimination, for those of you who read British case law, you probably all are aware of the judgment of the High Court in the Right to Rent case, where the um, High Court held that the obligation of um, landlords to check the immigration status of anybody they wanted to rent their property to was unlawful under British law, and the whole legal basis was non discrimination. But it's non discrimination on that ground which is highly disputed in international law, non-discrimination on the basis of nationality. When you read the judgment of uh, Mr. Justice Spencer, you see he has incorporated non-discrimination on the basis of nationality as an inherent part of the British Constitution as well as international obligations. And that non-discrimination on the basis of nationality is of course the amazing um, innovation of EU law. Because in international law, there would be no immigration control if we couldn't discriminate on the basis of nationality. What would you do at the border? Everybody would have to be treated as a citizen. Anyway, uh, but you can see that there is a huge move in, the, in international law, and those of you who follow the International Court of Justice will have been or may be aware of the case that Qatar has taken against United Arab Emirates. They've been disputing one another for quite a while. And last summer, it was all about uh, Qatar, uh, UAE uh, passed a law that it would expel all Qatari nationals from the United Arab Emirates. It's done so, it's part of it. the law is there. And Qatar uh, challenged the, that decision in the International Court of Justice using its legal base only served the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination, which does not prohibit nationality discrimination in immigration and border. Uh, measures. And Qatar argues that the principle of non discrimination includes discrimination between different categories of non nationals. 
In, on the 27th of July, the International Court of Justice gave um, interim relief to Qatar, prohibiting UAE from expelling Qatari nationals, but reserving the question of the application of discrimination on the basis of nationality to the full hearing, so another five years from now. Anyway, upwards and onwards. We have, to the Sustainable Development Goals, only 35 references. So, what is the link? And uh, there you have paragraph 15. And of course, the link of migration and development is a dodgy one. If you look at the OECD reports, you will see that one of the biggest countries of origin of migrants moving around the world is the United States of America. And no one asks what the push factors are that are pushing migrants, U.S. nationals, out of the United States. People don't even talk about the pull factors. The idea that the U.S would be such an important country of origin of migration is not on the table. The statistics don't matter. Uh, therefore, the whole idea that somehow migration is related to development undermines the whole idea that migration is not an underdeveloped or lower developed to more developed uh, scenario. It is a natural phenomenon. And of course this, uh, uh, this, this link to development then undermines the empirical basis on which we are building this link. Of course the reason for it is because it was the only basis that the UN could agree upon. Okay, so nobody was having migration anywhere else so they stuffed it into SDGs and then that gave the possibility of a way forward. The link with human rights, well, we've got a thing on about non regression and non discrimination already. And we have uh, the commitment in paragraph 15 to full uh, effective respect for protection and fulfillment of human rights at all stages. Uh, and from that point, we then need to see well, what human rights. And the ones which are specifically mentioned are the big human rights framework of the UN, virtually all states have ratified the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. Most of them, though not as many, the economic and social, social and cultural rights. Many fewer, the Convention on Migrant Workers, but it's creeping up there. It's creeping up there. It's much more, uh, much more substantial now than was expected in 1990. We have the rights of the child, and we have the UN and regional frameworks. So we're going to try and build this compact on the basis of the Human Rights Commitment in the regional frameworks, Inter-American, African Union, Europe, the Council of Europe, etc. What is the sustainable development? Well, we have the 2030 agenda with quite a, uh, um, a substantial uh, effort to build on that, the Addis Ababa Action Agenda, Sendai Framework for Disaster Reduction, and the New Urban Agenda. So those are the bits which are referred to in the um, Global Compact itself. Then we have the framework, and Vincent has uh, set this out quite clearly. Uh, it's got its vision guiding principles, it's a cooperative framework, then it's got its objectives and commitments, uh, and everybody's supposed to get involved in this, national and local levels, the whole series of obligations which are supposed to be carried out by local authorities, we have a meeting back in September with a number of British local authorities. Uh, and also we had some Dutch ones came over and a couple of Belgian ones. And we asked them if anybody had asked them their view uh, in the British government or the Dutch government when they signed up to the Global Compact on all the things that they're supposed to do as a result. And they said, no, nobody had spoken to them or their associations about all these new duties that the Compact would create for them to carry out. And then we have the question of follow-up. And review. And now moving on to implementation. How am I doing on time? Uh, you've got uh, seven minutes. Oh, good. Uh, so um, now the question is who's going to implement all of this? We have Global, UN, and I'm sure that we're going to hear from our institutions about what they'll do. We have Regional. So in our region, 
that will be Council of Europe and the European Union. We have national, that will be the British government. And we have local, those are all our local authorities. And local will probably also include, for instance, the devolved parts of the UK, Scotland, Northern Ireland, Wales, will have uh, their own um, obligations to carry out. Uh, implementation is to be consistent with our rights and obligations under international law. So we're back to international human rights law. So we're supposed to implement to make sure that at all levels of government, human rights law is inherent in the way in which uh, the uh, compact is carried out. I would just mention in this regard uh, the Immigration Law Practitioners Association here in the UK is producing a handbook for lawyers and judges on the meaning of the compact uh, for them in UK law. And uh, the, there's a committee that's putting this together, it's mainly practitioners, but with some academics and some judges. And they've done over 40 interviews with practicing lawyers, divided that by the 23 objectives, asking them what the objective would mean in terms of their practice of law in the UK and UK law. And the results, which were now, which are now being written up, uh, for the handbook are astonishing that almost every single objective gives rise to an obligation for the UK to change some law or practice or rule which is currently in place. And that's even taking into account that the objectives are quite wide and that the menu of actions the state can take to achieve the objectives are very generous to states and yet still their practices under every one of the objectives which the UK is applying, which are inconsistent, according to the lawyers, to what is actually happening in practice. So, the compact is not legally binding on the UK, but the political commitment of the UK is legally binding. Okay? So, yes, okay, and this, is, uh, this was my great complaint about um, the German Chancellor's big statement in favour of the compact. Uh, when the trolls were out going for it in November 2018. They said, oh, it's not legally binding, it's all we can sign up to this, there's no legal consequence. But if a state binds itself politically, that has legal consequences. I mean, this was decided by the, the Supreme Court here in Hartman Pepper. You all teach this in our, in, our, in our courses on constitutional law. If a state says we're going to do something, then the courts must have regard to that statement when it's interpreting the law which the state has passed in respect of the field of law. So it can have regard to the intention of Parliament and the state's commitments in terms of uh, commitments. And again, the example which I think is the most interesting in Europe because it's a document which is infinitely more flimsy than the global compact on migration is the judicial uh, attention and respect which is given to the uh, UNHCR handbook on refugees, which was written by one little bloke in some room in Geneva you know, 20 years ago, 40 years ago, and yet has been given a standing by the courts as being virtually uh, legally binding in the United States. It's very, very now that you find any court anywhere in Europe which is willing to implement or which is willing to interpret the Refugee Convention in a manner which is inconsistent with that handbook. Right? So we have to see what are the what kinds of the and the global compact on migration has infinitely more authority, having been signed up to specifically by the British government, than the handbook. So we have a framework of coherence. These are not states can't do in the international venue, sign up to anything they want to, without any consequences at home. Of course there is. We, have, we live in a world of rule of law. Rule of law is not just internal, it's not just external, but it also attaches to the political statements which we make at the international level and the national level. I'm not bad mind about that session. So, our interstate framework. Uh, we're going to be looking at bilateral, we're going to be looking at regional, we're going to be looking at multilateral forms of cooperation. I would say in our field, what does that mean? I would say we need to be suggesting to the European Court of Human Rights 
that it should have regard to the compact now when determining cases about migration. I would say that for the European Union, this means that the preambles of all of the directives and regulations in the field of migration should include a reference to the compact, because the compact is now the, uh, the, the mechanism, the political will of the member states, probably not a few of them, uh, in the regional setting. This will then provide an opportunity for our national administrations, our regional, our national courts, our regional courts, to have regard to the compact when considering the correct interpretation of the <coughs> law or of the European Convention on Human Rights. This is using existing mechanisms, platforms, and frameworks. I was just talking to some of the, they were renegotiating the EU ACP agreement, the COGNO agreement with the African, uh, Caribbean, Pacific countries. And in the context of those negotiations, I was saying, you, know, you should put into the preamble of the new agreement which will replace Cotonou a reference to the compact. This is relevant for you, you have all signed up to this. We have the question of North, South, and South, South in the Sustainable Development Goals, and that takes us back to this imbalance, this framework of migration. We think, well, it's all of them coming here from South to North, and we don't think of you know, the example I gave with the US nationals, we could use the Brits. Now we're in Brexit, look where the Brits are. There's so many, there's you know, a million and a half Brits, that's a huge number, living in other United States, where there are only about three million from the 27, a much larger set of countries in the UK. Now, I think that um, Christina will talk about the, the, the mechanisms and the, the hub so I'm going to skip over that for a moment. And if you're not, you'll never know that. <laughs> You'll have to go to another conference for someone's mind and we'll talk about it because they were putting a lot of energy into that. Um, so then we've got all of these different bodies that would be involved. And what I would say about these bodies, if you look at paragraph 44, is how disaggregated this is. This is the state not just disaggregating within the state and going down to local authorities. It's disaggregating into society. Uh, and uh, you know, we're going to have faith, faith based organizations there, uh, for the private sector. Uh, I'm sure that uh, Richard will talk to you about the trade unions and the ILO's contribution. And uh, for some reason, they really like the um, Red Cross and West Crescent, Crescent movement. Somebody got stuck in there. I don't know if one would really want to be named as uh, part of the implementation team, and I have no idea how many of these. Uh, bodies which was implement <coughs> the compact were ever consulted by governments. As I said, we had the meeting with the local authorities in the UK and they'd never heard. Well, the, the Dutch ones had heard of it, but they'd never, been, um, they'd never been consulted by the government about what needs to be done. So, what would I say is the next most important thing on the agenda for implementation and review? I presented quite a positive picture about how the compact can be used to lift and focus on human rights standards as applicable to migrants across the world. Other people will give a much more negative view of this as we go along. But I think there's a real opportunity here, if we look at the compact, to try and use this to build, to bring more focus on human rights, and to build on the non-aggression principle. So we need indicators. Uh, we need indicators uh, for the 23 objectives about what, how are you going to test whether or not the state is correctly applying each indicator in respect to its human rights obligations. What are you going to look for? What are the five key features? For instance, um, there, there's a, we're working on a project on a set of indicators that we think might be useful. Is there a law, rule of law? Do you have a proper law which permits the detention of foreigners? In the UK there isn't. It's all based on one statement by um, Barbara Roach back in 2000, and this is, there's no real law in Parliament, and there's no real law that covers the detention of foreigners in the UK. So the first thing is, is there a law? Are there remedies? All of these sort of basic rule of law things, indicators, to see whether or not the objectives are being properly implemented by the member states. And what I would say is, all right, so then what do we do? We, get, we set up a, a bunch of indicators for each one of the objectives. From a human rights perspective, there'll be other 
indicators for SDGs. We're not going to that. We need to look at what are the standards. And then we need to figure out where is the review. So, of course, our main, main review mechanisms internally are our courts. They're the ones that have to decide. So we're going to try and provide them with criteria to indicate whether or not there is review. But I think we also, because the global compact migration is based on the principle of human rights and non-regression, is it not a terribly useful tool for universal periodic review in the UN? And on that note, I will leave it to the next presentation. Thank you.